excellent for 20 years, editor-in-chief of a daily newspaper, and finally first out of pure benevolence, try to convince him, listen, everything is running perfectly, why don't you take a break, a holiday? And the guy said, no, I'm afraid. Everything is now so dependent on me, I run the machinery that if I go, there will be a catastrophe. What I'm afraid of is that if I go, there will be a catastrophe, the newspaper would no longer function. Then Hearst, to calm him down, said, don't worry, everything would function perfectly as if you are here. And the guy said, that's what I'm even more afraid of. <laughs> <laughs> you even notice that, no? <coughs> so again, uh, along these lines, I want to briefly, briefly develop what attracts me in quantum physics. The underlying idea is, I will put it in very simple terms, is this one. How does what Freud calls drive, trib, relate to what in Buddhism is called this? It's even, I know it's very problematic, I don't know enough to give you a good translation, this, uh, the wheel of desire or whatever, no? Like, uh, are they the same? So, can you say that, that uh, when you reach Nirvana, and I'm here not simplifying Buddhism, I know very well that that's the ABC of Buddhism, that reaching Nirvana doesn't mean we shouldn't falsify it in the European spiritualist way. Reaching Nirvana authentically doesn't mean you are up in some void and so on. It means you are here fully in this life. You know, this the most famous Buddhist triad. First you think apple is an apple, then you see the vanity, you learn apple is not an apple, but true wisdom is when you return to it, no? It's again apple is an apple, no? So, with all this knowing, what happens to drive? Is uh, when the will, when what Buddhists describe as this will of desire or... Uh, again, it's even problematic, longing or whatever, I don't know enough how to call it, but when, when you step out of it, what happens? I claim that all Freudian psychoanalysis stands or falls on the premise that desire, no, sorry, uh, what Freud calls drive is not the same as this will of desire. That is to say that even when you step out, or as we would have put it in psychoanalytic terminology, when you traverse the fantasy, something still moves. This is why the basic thesis of my new book, I even for some time flirted with the idea that this should be the title, will be this, you know, Galileo, e pur si muove. Yeah. Nonetheless, it moves. So, you reach the zero point, nonetheless, it moves. Something continues to move. And, again, the name for this something, for me, is, is uh, the Freudian drive. Incidentally, did you notice how nicely ambiguous this Galilean e pur si muove is. I think you are who made a nice remark uh, two days ago to which I want to connect. Namely, usually we read this e pur si muove in this vulgar, empiricist, anti-theoretical way. You know, like, haha, in your theory, this is how Galileo is usually read. Ah, okay, I concede to the church, but nonetheless, the earth moves around, like all your shitty theories cannot change the simple fact that it is like this. But I think it would have been much more productive in the strict Marxist sense of the critique of ideology to turn it around and to claim, isn't a poor simove also a very good name for the very persistence of ideological illusion? Like, you can prove it wrong, but a poor simove. You know, here I would have, but I will not repeat that, which is why it's for me the basic mechanism of ideology, the joke I will not. You know, the guy who thinks he is a grain, and, uh, 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 but the chicken doesn't know it. So, he knows, but a poor simove. It goes on. Or, as Alenka Zupancic, the bitch of whom I'm afraid to <laughs> explain this to you, developed very nicely of how you can apply the same joke also to religion. You know, her wonderful idea, I quote it, is that you can apply the same logic of 
I know I'm no longer a grain to be eaten by a chicken, but does the chicken know it? No, like her wonderful idea is imagine a kind of a Jacobin totalitarian atheist regime where if you are religious, they cure you. No, okay, so one is cured, I know there is no God, but then she comes back back running like I feel guilty God wants to take revenge on me. And then, then the party professor, doctor, tells him, but now you know that God doesn't exist. And he says, I know, but God doesn't know that he doesn't exist. <laughs> this is the true materialist formula of atheism. It's easy for us to know the truth. You know, the unconscious, the big other has to admit it doesn't exist. And this, as you probably know, is the base, to put it in very simplified terms, of my reading of Christianity. Mm -hmm. That is more atheist than usual atheism, because as Chester concluded, only in Christianity, on those wonderful moments in the book of Job, or that works on the cross, Father, why you have abandoned me, it's the moment of blasphemy where, in a way, God himself no longer believes in himself. No? And Chesterton is wonderful in demonstrating how Without, uh, without these moments of blasphemy, you lose the whole point of Christianity. And he develops this in such a wonderful way, for example, apropos of praying. He was so fascinated, Chesterton, I read this in his travel of when he visited uh, Jerusalem in 1910-2020, that he was looking for that Gethsemane garden or whatever and asked a small, uh, a small uh, a Palestinian kid and the kid first didn't understand, they told him, ah, you mean the place where God himself was praying. And then Jester made this wonderful point that in all other religions we pray to God. Mm. Only in Christianity do you have a moment where God himself is praying. <laughs> Everything gets uh, complicated. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, uh, uh, okay, we still have time. Uh, okay, so, uh, the idea is what? Why? do I turn to this horror of Hicks field? Very simply, maybe even you know it, but I want to get a counter-attack if you want. You know what is this mysterious Hicks field? And to be very clear, now I'm well aware of the scientific complexities of it. I'm well aware that although now, incidentally, Europe is spending billions of dollars to Basically, they did all this reorganization of that CERN mega laboratory, whatever, to accelerator, particle accelerator. The basic aim is to find this so-called divine particle and so on. Why is this so fascinating? Again, let me give you the simple line. And at least this, maybe it's wrong, but at least I copied it. <laughs> In some sense, it should be true. No. <laughs> the Higgs field controls whether forces and particles, how they behave. When the Higgs field is a, a field of force, which, when it is switched on operative, symmetries are broken between elementary particles and differences patterns of differences emerge. When sweet, uh, Higgs field is off, force and particle are indistinguishable in a state of vacuum. That's the idea. So we see why the stakes are so high. Uh, the so-called Higgs particle is basically, the, this is why it's called, I simplify, divine particle. The idea is that it's the particle which creates something out of nothing. Of course, this nothing is not the empty nothing. It's just this void in the physical sense. Void as potentially everything. This potentially productive void. And the question is, the problem is, of course, how is the symmetry broken or however you put it? How does differentiation occur? The idea is that there is a special particle which like disturbs the symmetry of a vacuum. Uh, now, uh, what's here the problem? The problem is, uh, so again, it is, now we, yeah, uh, we discover here, we again try to write it, to make it clear. Mm. Uh, that's the, the problem is 
the following one. It's a wonderful dialectical paradox. Okay, oh. okay, 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 but you will get it. Uh, what you have thought is, let's, let's say, this is the, uh, let's say we have here the, uh, the, uh, okay, whatever. The point is this one. Let us say that we have here the force of uh, how much energy is spent the force of the Higgs field, and here it's how much symmetry balance is broken or whatever. The paradox is this one, that if you want to have zero, no distinction, you already have to spend some of it. You see the paradox? Yeah. The paradox is that uh, here, from here on it's normal. The more Higgs field is active, the more universe is differentiated. But the surprise is that we don't have here what we would have expected, a pure zero where you spend nothing and the universe is non-differentiated, the void. There is an irreducible gap here. Again, the paradox is that energetically, there is a something which costs less than nothing. If you spend no energy, you don't get a pure vacuum. You already get some strange differentiation. And to arrive at the pure vacuum, you already have to spend something. Mm -hmm. And that's the basic mystery. And all I'm saying is the following. That. Now, uh, uh, that this brings us then to what they call in, in, uh, all this, uh, in physics uh, the two vacuums. You have a false vacuum which is where things are totally at peace but it costs something and a true vacuum in the sense that you spend nothing but this true vacuum cost, uh, cost, cost uh, this true vacuum uh, where you spend nothing is already something there is already a differentiation so why is this uh, why is this for me at least uh, again so fascinating because uh, you see, because you get here literally, in a way, something which is less than nothing, in a way. Higgs, this would have been made the definition of the Higgs particle, a something which, again, is cheaper than nothing. The idea is, and this would be my answer to Buddhism when I mention this, how a Purshimwave. This is the Purshimwave. Mm -hmm. If you go to a true zero point, you don't get peace. Peace. You get already some movement. Yeah. But for me, desire, what Buddhists call samsara, begins here. This would be the illusion. This is nirvana, but fuck it, you have this here. A certain movement, no? Although in Buddhism also, you find some wonderful things, indications, things are never as simple as they appear, of this paradox. Namely, because of my charm, yeah, 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 I've seen it four times, although it fit the new version of Karate Kid with Jackie Chan, my God, what I have to do for my son. And there, uh, there is 